What's going on folks? It's Mike here and in this lesson we're going to continue our C++ series talking about the address of operator. Now this is an operator that's going to return you the memory address of a variable or a function in memory. So let's go ahead and dive in and see what this looks like. All right, so what I've got set up here is address of and on the left side of my screen a few variables of the primitive types that we've created. And I'll go ahead and make this just a little bit bigger for you, just so you can refresh and see these variable types. Now recall, we have integers, floats, chars, which are just a single byte, signed char, which is usually the same thing as char, but you can be a little bit more explicit, and unsigned char, which is just a value of 0 to 255. So you can review in a previous lesson these primitive types if you'd like. Now, let's go ahead and talk about what address of means and why we care about it. Well, the address of, again, tells us where in memory, the actual memory address where each of these variables live. So previously, we've also learned about things like the stack and the scope of variables. So just to review that very quickly, these variables, or each of these x, y, a, b, c, and so on, are scoped between the parentheses of main here. That's the only place that they're available. We can't refer to these in other functions, for instance. So if I go ahead and create another function here, and I'm just going to call it foo, which is sort of a standard function name when you don't know what to call something, I can't set x equal to some other value here. In fact, I'll try to compile it, and you'll see that it wasn't declared in the scope. So let me go ahead and just comment this out for now and try to help you again visualize what's going on here in our program here. So again, we've got our main function here. And within main, we've got the curly braces, which define the scope here and here. So local to this main function has its own sort of stack of memory, where I have the variable x, y, a, let me draw that a little bit cleaner here, b, and c that all belong to this stack frame within this actual function here. And if I make other function calls, then this needs to be stored on the stack. Or if I allocate memory within foo, this also needs to be stored somewhere. But let's not worry about all those details for now. Let's just try to figure out where exactly x lives, its memory location. And what this means is on your actual machine, this variable has to live somewhere. And you've got lots of different types of memory. For instance, you've got your hard drive, which might be a terabyte or two terabytes or even larger. And you've also got things like RAM, which are those green sticks of memory that I'll pop in here just so you have a visual that you may have installed or been told to install because they make your machine run faster. That's sort of your working memory. And while talking about the sort of memory hierarchy is a little bit beyond the series because we're just trying to learn C++, what you just need to know is that this memory has some location that uniquely identifies X. And how we get that is by using the ampersand, which I like to think of the address of operator. So let's go ahead and see this in practice and what it means. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is go ahead and include our IO stream library so that we can do some output here. And I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger, uh, just so that you can see everything at once. And let's go ahead and print off the addresses of each of these variables here. So from our standard library, I'll use C out. And then I'm just going to put the variable name, a colon, and then another uh, stream operator here, ampersand x, and then end line here. And again, this is going to retrieve the address of x here. And let's go ahead and repeat this for each of our other variables here, for y, a, b, and c. And I'll make sure that I also put y, a, b, and c here. And let's go ahead and compile this. And oops, just a little mistake here, <laughs> little warning here when you copy and paste sometimes. That sometimes means you have to fix the mistakes in multiple locations. So let's go ahead and do this and re-enter those. And there we are. Okay, so now if I run this, you'll actually see the address of x here, y, a, b, c, and so on. Now, something a little bit strange is going on here. Let's just focus on x and y for now. So right now, they are giving us the hexadecimal address. That is, again, somewhere in your working memory, that's these guys here, your RAM, that variable is being stored. So this has a address. And if I look at this carefully here, you'll notice that the last uh, digit here in the hexadecimal address here is offset by 4. 
Now, why four? Well, let's go ahead and just confirm the size of an integer on our machine. So previously we learned size of X, or I could just do size of int, the type. I'm just gonna do uh, X here, and I'll put an end line. And let's just go ahead and add a, a little bit of output. X is size and a colon, and we'll rerun this, recompile. And again, you'll see that it's four bytes to store an integer. So we are offset by four here. Okay, so now we know the actual physical location in memory. Well, actually that's a little bit of a lie because we have to talk about virtual memory and some of these things, but at least you know for this particular program that X lives in this location. And you can verify anywhere else in your program that this is the same X by just looking at its memory location. Because remember this variable name here, X, well, this is really just a convenience for us. We can name it anything. We can name it X, Y, Mike, Michael, whatever we want. Uh, but the actual machine understands to find this value of X, this sort of symbol, and look at this memory location to give us our integer 42, or whatever is stored in this memory location at a given time. All right, so we understand that part. Hopefully we're okay there. And just understand that, again, address of over here gives us where in memory some variable lives. Now with the characters here, this is a little bit strange here because we have ampersand A, ampersand B, and it's just giving us the actual character names. Uh, a, B, C, B, C, and C, and a little star after it. Hmm. Now that's a little bit strange here when we try to print the address of. Well, this is going to be a little bit strange, but whenever we have some sort of address that's a character here, C++ starts interpreting this as a string. So we're going to have to talk a little bit about how strings are represented in standard string later on in this series. But for now, what we're going to have to do is just cast this so it's treated as a different type. So just bear with me for now while I go ahead and change the type here, that is cast it to something different, by putting a type name in front of this. Now, what we're going to want to do is do something like this, void star, and then the type here. And I'm going to repeat this here, and once again here. Now, we haven't talked about what this star means. Uh, this is a pointer, and we're going to have to get to that in the lesson here. But let me go ahead and recompile, rerun, and then this time you can now see the addresses of A, B, and C. What this star here is, again, I'll just give a, a little preface here to what we'll be talking about in future lessons is a pointer which stores an address of something. So that's saying explicitly treat this A, B, and C as an address and then return the address of that here, which is what we care about. So then we can see where A lives, where B lives, and where C lives. And again, you can see that they're offset just by one byte because a character only takes one byte of memory to store. So that's the address up. Now, a few more things that I want to actually show you here. Well, functions live somewhere else too in memory as well. So functions can have addresses and we can figure out what the address of this function is. So foo, for instance, let's try to print out the address of foo. And I'm just going to add this to our list here, foo. And for this one, I'll just put foo. And let's go ahead and recompile, rerun, and hmm, again, foo is one here. So we're going to have to do this same trick here for our uh, function here. Put the void star in, recompile, and now we can print and find out exactly where in memory this function exists. Because again, where this function or this block of code exists is different from our main function. In fact, we can also find the address of our main function by doing the same trick here. So let me go ahead and just do this uh, once again. And let's go ahead and put in main, recompile. And now you find out roughly where your program starts from in the main function here. So you have the address. Now, a lot of times folks will get a little bit misled when they see this syntax here. And again, I do like to think about this operator here, the ampersand symbol, as an actual function. And functions take parameters. So sometimes what I'll do, just for clarity in different lessons, or at least for this one, so you can, again, think of this or memorize this as address of, is wrap in parentheses the actual variable here. 
And I'll do the same here. And we could do the same for all of our other variables as well. So let's just go ahead and recompile just to show you that that works uh, just the same here. Uh, and you can see we get the address of the particular variable. So you can sort of think of it like the size of that we've been doing previously. So folks, that's it for now. We've talked about address of, and you can go ahead and practice and see how the variables, uh, you can retrieve the addresses of variables as well as functions. Now we are going to see this symbol again, the ampersand used when we talk about references later. So I don't want you to get too overwhelmed with some of the overloaded symbols in C++, but for the most part, the golden nugget in this lesson is that you understand that you can retrieve where in memory a variable or function exists. And that's going to be helpful for debugging and when we start managing our memory. So folks, if you've enjoyed this lesson in our C++ series, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the future lessons. And we'll see you in the next lesson very, very soon. Take care.